Okay, welcome to Physics 7C. Let's get started. Uh, so if you're in the wrong place, this is your time to take off, but this is Physics 7C. Um, and uh, I'm Professor Daniel Whiteson from the Physics Department. Uh, website for this class is here, which you can also get on Triple E. Um, my office is in Rhinus Hall, which is a big, big building next door. Um, 3160 is my office number. Uh, I'm there pretty often, so you can just come by and talk to me if you need to, or send me an email. Um, also, I have times that I guarantee I will be sitting there waiting for somebody to come by and ask me questions. Um, nobody ever comes to my office hours, is my experience. So don't feel like you didn't make an appointment so you can't come, just come on by. Also, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there all the time just working on stuff, so if you really need to talk about something, just come by. If I'm too busy, I'll tell you I'm too busy. Okay? Okay, so this is the textbook we're using. Uh, it's a 13th edition. There is a 12th edition out there, which a lot of people have. It's very similar. They basically generate a new edition every time they want to make more money, and so the editions are very similar to each other. Um, I'm going to be referencing problems from the book, so if you have the wrong edition, you might do the wrong problem. Um, but if you have the 12th edition, you have a friend with the 13th edition, you can do the cross-checking yourself. We're not going to be using the book much in class. You don't need to bring it with you. We're not going to be popping it open or anything. It's mostly for your review. You should be reading this stuff on your own to make sure you have an understanding before you come to class. It's for your reference. It's also for the homeworks. Okay, <clears throat> so today I'm mostly just going to talk about the organization of the class first, how we're going to be doing things, we're going to practice our clickers, and then I'll give you a, re a re review of what you should already know before we start Physics 7. Remember at UCI we have two levels of physics introductory. We have Physics 2, which most of you tested out of, and so I'll be covering all the stuff that we teach in Physics 2 today in one class. And I'll be going pretty quick. But if you feel like this material I'm presenting today is not something you're very comfortable with, then come talk to me. Maybe you, you're in the wrong section. But if you feel like, wow, today was really boring and easy, uh, then you're well set up for Physics 7. Okay? All right, so how are we going to organize the grades for this class? Well, you see there's two exams. There's a midterm exam somewhere halfway through the quarter. It's going to be a quarter of your grade. The final exam is going to be most of your grade. Okay? It's 50% of your grade. That's because that's really going to test your understanding of the concepts. For the final exam, I'm going to ask you to pull together everything you know to solve problems you haven't seen before. And that's really going to test your understanding of the physics. Uh, we also have quizzes, which I'll talk about. Uh, we have graded homeworks, which we do every week. And then we have in-class responses using iClickers. And we'll talk about that also. Now, sometimes I'll send them out an email extra credit quiz just before class. I want you to read the book before you come to class so that when you're hearing me talk about something, it's not the first time you're hearing about it. And uh, these email quizzes will be very easy if you've read the book. So it's, it's basically just free points if you're doing the reading. Okay, homework. There'll be two kinds of homework. There'll be graded homework and ungraded homework. Now, graded homework we're going to do online. It's Mastering Physics website. It lets, if you haven't used it before, basically I assign a problem from the book you type in the answers online and it tells you immediately whether you've done something right or whether you've done it right or wrong. It can even give you hints. And there's a new feature on it this year that if you get some problems wrong, it can try to deduce the concepts that you're not understanding and give you extra practice problems on those concepts. So it's sort of a cool system. And it eliminates the need for you to turn things in on paper, for me to grade things on paper, so it's very convenient. You need to sign up for this. So you need to go to this website, um, enter your access code, and then sign up for my class. Okay? I have not enrolled everybody in this class. You need to go and sign up for the class. And then when you do the homework, it will automatically be sent to me as the grade. Every time I assign homework, I'll give you graded homeworks, which are Mastering Physics, and then ungraded homeworks, which are just problems out of the book. And I choose these problems because they're similar to the kinds of problems I use on the exams. So if you're doing the ungraded homeworks, so you'll have a good idea of what kind of problems to expect on the midterm and on the final. In fact, a lot of um, problems that ungraded are problems from last year's midterm or final. And this year's midterm and final might be other ungraded problems from the previous year. So it's the pool of questions from which I take the final. So you should be doing these just to practice and to get a sense for how well you're doing. Also, there's a discussion section organized for this class. It's on Wednesday. And sometimes during that discussion section, we'll have a quiz. Those quizzes will be taken exactly from the ungraded problems. So if you've done the ungraded problem, ungraded homework problems, 
you'll show up for the quiz seeing a problem you have already done. Basically, you get 100% on the quiz. That's just to motivate you to do the ungraded problems. Okay? So Mastering Physics is probably new to you guys. It's a pretty cool website. Um, you need to either buy it online or you can use a code that comes with the book. I mean, if you buy the book at the bookstore. Uh, so you need to enroll in this class. Again, here's the code. And this code is also on the class syllabus. And if you have any problems with it, send me an email. Um, everybody get online and, um, and try to log into that and make sure it works. Okay? <clears throat> We're also going to be using clickers. Uh, clickers are a really nice way for me to get a sense for how much you're understanding and to require you to pay attention because it requires you to actually do something rather than just sit there and zone out. Um, and the, your participation is worth 5% of your final grade. So the way it works is every, every class I'll have like 10 or 15 clicker questions built into the lecture. I'll teach you something and then I'll ask you a question about it and you guys can answer. And if you um, respond to, I think it's 80% of the questions in one course, in one lecture you get credit for that course. Okay, so you need to show up and do this. This is more important when I was teaching this class at 8 a.m. and there was a serious disincentive for people to show up at 8 a.m. So it was nice to get people to come in. This is an after lunch class, so you're probably looking for a nice place to relax anyway. Um, <clears throat> and you guys are physics majors, so I don't think attendance would be a big issue. But also it encourages you to pay attention, okay? And the way it works is you, <clears throat> you buy it, you register it online with your student ID number. So your clicker has some clicker ID number. And then online, you connect your clicker ID number with your student ID number, right? So that tells me who has which clicker. And when you use the clicker in class, this little base station here receives the messages from your clickers and the clicker ID and it says clicker ID 7512, whatever, press C. And then later I can download this data and correlate it with the data from the website to figure out who pressed which button and who was here and, and uh, stuff like that. <coughs> okay? Now if you have problems with your clicker, because sometimes these things have problems, this is the guy on campus who's Mr. Clicker. He's happy to get your emails. He loves to fix these things. So don't email me technical clicker questions. Ask him. Yes? Do you get credit for the clicker that you missed the questions? I don't care what you press as long as you press the button. <laughs> you can fall asleep with your nose on E for the whole class. It's fun. OK, so let's practice using the clickers. Make sure we all know how to do it. So first, turn on your clicker. Now, sometimes when you buy the clicker, it comes with a little um, plastic wrap that protects the battery so it doesn't get drained during shipping. So if it's not turning on, maybe you forgot to remove the plastic, whatever. Now, I have, this is, these pictures are from the iClicker 1, all right? And iClicker 1 is a simple clicker. There's no screen on it. Recently, they upgraded and now they're selling iClicker 2, which should be compatible with iClicker 1. But if you have the old iClicker 1, that's fine. If you bought iClicker 2, that's also fine. Okay? And now you need to set the frequency for your clicker to be CC. All right? And I think there are, I don't have one of these anymore, but I think you set it on, there should be instructions for how to set the frequency. Yeah, hold it for two seconds. The power button. Hold the power button for two seconds and then press CC, right? Yeah. Okay. Because this base station here is tuned to CC. And the reason is there's another classroom over there that's using VB or something, and we don't want your clicker responses to get sent over there. Okay? All right, so let's just practice. The way this works is I put a question on the slides, and then I come up here and I say, and I open it up for answers. Okay, and you'll see. This clock is ticking, and sometimes they'll give you 10 seconds if it's an easy one, or a minute if you're actually working out a problem or whatever. You can see how much time is left. You can also see how many people have answered, right? Now, this question is stupid. Um, obviously, it's just, you know, you can't press no if you have your clicker. Um, but <clears throat> we can also, I think if I press this one, you know, we can see. <laughs> now, it's interesting. See, everybody presses A if they have no idea. So I normalize the distribution of this. I know this. Yes. And for some reason, E is so much fun, isn't it? Right? Yeah. OK, so we have. So we only have 33 clickers here. Are there people here who have clickers who are not working? Do you have a problem with it? You don't have a clicker today. Are you going to lose uh, one, how many classes do we have? 21 classes? 
You lose one twenty one of five percent of your final grade. Um, I think you'll be okay. Do you have a problem with yours? C C. Yes. Not sending. Try turning it off, powering it up, setting the CC again. 34, okay. But seriously, we should, we're supposed to have 70 something people in this class, and I see a lot more than 34 people here. 35, somebody woke up? Okay. All right, and then I do stop. Okay, questions about the clicker? Everybody gets the idea? Yes, in the back. Can you change your answer until you close it? You can change your answer, yeah. Change, set an answer, you change the answer, whatever. But remember, I'm not grading you on the accuracy of your answer, just your success in communicating an answer. Okay, so here let's do one with a real question. The right, question is, after eating lunch and coming sitting here in a dark room, is it really possible to learn some physics? In the discussion section, which will be led by our TA, um, we're going to have, most of the time we're just going to go over the ungraded homework problems. So if you try the ungraded homework first before you show up to the discussion section, you'll be primed with questions to help you understand these problems. Uh, if you show up and have not tried the prep problems at all, you won't get as much out of it. So I really encourage you to try the ungraded homework before you come to discussion, and the TA will go through those problems with you. Okay, because physics is really all about learning how to solve these problems. Um, now, sometimes you'll show up, and instead of having a discussion, you'll just have a quiz over the problem. So you really should have tried them in advance. That'll give you a leg up. And they're not going to be announced in advance, right? Some weeks you'll have it, some weeks you won't. There's no makeups, et cetera. OK, we have a midterm exam, which we in class on October 24th, 2000, oops, 2013. You missed it two years ago. And um, you all get zeros. Yeah, right, unless you invent a time machine, then you get 100%. Um, and then uh, the final exam is December 13th. Back, I think I put the room number wrong here. Anyway, we'll get, um, <clears throat> as we get closer to that, we'll update that information. We were supposed to be in Roland Hall, but then two days ago, we got moved to this room. So some of the information might still be out of date. Okay, sometimes I'll send out email quiz just before class. If you read the material, it'll be very easy. Sometimes in class, if you ask a good question, and I think shows you've been listening and like applying your brain, I'll just give you extra credit on the spot, okay? I really encourage you to ask questions, think out loud, interact. Um, okay, now, so since this is first quarter and most of you are freshmen, and you're just at the beginning of your um, epic college careers, I just want to give you a little bit of advice. Okay, about how you're not in high school anymore. So now you're adults, right? You're all grown up, and you're supposed to take responsibility for yourself. So we're here to give you the information you need, to help you, to teach you, but we're not your parents, and it's mostly up to you what you get out of this class, and also out of college. Okay, if you're here to really learn something, then make sure you're really learning something, and ask questions until you figure things out. Do the homework until you understand the concepts. Get those things ingrained in your brain. Physics is a language, and you can't really do it until you become fluent with the basics. And that's what we're going to do with this quarter, is really teach you the basics. Okay? And you have to absolutely be fluent in order for, to speak the language and do any poetry and, and do anything interesting in physics. Okay? So take responsibility for your own learning. Do the homeworks. Think carefully about what you're doing. Don't just try to master each homework problem until it's done. Really try to understand the concepts. All right? And stay organized. I'm not calling you the night before to make sure that you've figured everything out. I'm not going to wake you up in the morning and give you a cup of tea, right? You're adults. I'm an adult. We're supposed to have an adult uh, relationship here. Um, and the last thing is, 
don't fall behind. Okay, we're going to build concept on concept on concept. Once we learn something, we're going to, going to use something else which requires understanding that. So you can't just wait to the midterm and then cram it all and hope to be fluent in one evening. Okay? It's not like history where you can just jam all the facts in your head, you know, regurgitate them on the exam, and then forget everything. Okay, so if you have questions about physics, you know, you're, you read something interesting, you heard something, you don't know if it's true, if it's baloney, whatever, your um, roommate is a creationist and he's making some arguments you don't know how to dispute, whatever, <laughs> send me an email, <laughs> in my office hours, I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, if you have questions about how to solve a homework problem, um, the best thing is to email the TA. Um, I can also answer these questions, but um, go to the office hours, the, the TA also, there are tutors, do you guys know about the tutoring center? So every evening the TAs are in the tutoring center, they just sit there and help people who are working on their homework and having problems. It's also a good place to work with other people on the problems. Uh, you don't have to do the homework by yourselves, it's okay to work with other people. That doesn't mean you can copy verbatim from somebody else's homework. But you can talk to each other. It's not like a closed book final exam. If you have a question about grading, then you need to send something to me in writing, which means type it up or whatever, print it out, bring me a sheet of paper that says, that states your complaint about the grading, and then I will review your grade. And if you're still not satisfied, you can make an appointment and we can discuss in person. Question back. Where is the tutoring center? Oh, I don't recall the address. I'll send out an email to the class about it. Okay, it's, it's at least Roland Hall, second floor. So do you know the... If you go straight past, if you go through the entrance, it's straight past. Okay, I'll send out uh, the precise room information. Is this like PowerPoint going to be online later? Yes. So um, I have a set of slides prepared for every lecture, and I will post them online the night before. Um, however, I'm... Uh, as we'll, we'll discuss at the end of class, I will probably be doing a mixture of just presenting the slides to you or working on the whiteboard. The slides have the advantage that they're, they're better handwriting than I could manage. And they're nice like diagrams and stuff that I can show you in the slides. Uh, working on the whiteboard has the advantage that you see me working on a problem the way you would work on it. Rather than me walking you through the solution I laid out in advance, you see me writing it out and drawing the diagrams and making mistakes and correcting them. Uh, so some people really prefer one way of learning, some people another. I'll give you a little, you can vote at the end for what balance you'd like. But even when I am um, working on the whiteboard, I will have the slides prepared and they will be online for your reference. So all the information will be there anyway. Okay, any other questions about that? In fact, so this lecture is already on the webpage. Okay. So let's talk about physics, right? That's enough for the, um, I've already scared somebody away. Uh, let's talk about physics, right? That's enough of the preliminary stuff, how the class is organized. First, any other questions about class organization baloney? Yes? Is this permanently the classroom? As far as I know, this is our classroom for the whole quarter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't need your computer in class. I'll send them out the night before. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so what's fun about physics, right? Why is physics such an amazing tool? Well, I think physics is amazing because it lets us answer some really big questions about the world, right? And what do I mean by big questions? Well, you're just going to sit down and say, like, what are big questions about life, right? What are the questions we'd like answers to? You'd say things like, you know, what, what are things made of? Uh, what rules does everything follow? How did everything start? What's going to happen at the end of the, of the universe? You know, if, uh, how long before this piano falls down and squishes me? Um, and there's a whole list of questions you might ask yourself about the universe that we find ourselves in, right? As an inquisitive scientific personality, you have questions you want answers, right? Now, some of these questions, these ones here, these are real scientific questions, which means that not only are they big, fat, sexy questions of philosophy, <laughs> but they also have real answers. Answers we can measure, answers we can prove. Right? Real, hard, quantitative things that you can, get your, you can get your hands around. And that, to me, that's amazing. This is what's fantastic about physics, is that the questions it answers go really to the core of our questions about our own existence. Okay? Now, other questions here, these ones, also fascinating questions. But really, they're better suited to you know, smoking banana peels and hanging out in the philosophy department. 
because they don't really have scientific answers, right? Why are we here? We're never going to have a scientific answer to this, um, to this question. Okay, they're also fascinating questions, but, but not really probable by science. Okay, so, and then I also said that physics is a tool you can use to predict the future, right? What do I mean by predicting the future with, with, with physics? Well, when we do physics, what we're doing is building a model of the world, right? We have a specific question we want to answer, like, when is that piano going to squish me? Right? I want to know the answer to this question, and that's a question about the future, right? How many seconds do I have before I'm a pancake under that piano? And to do that, what we do is build models. So what do I mean by a model? Well, a model has a minimal, necessary description of the world. We don't like to do complex math, we don't have to. So we build a model that has the simplest possible description of the universe that gives the same answer, right? So it ignores all the irrelevant information about the universe and that's not relevant to the question at hand and is built out of objects we know mathematically how to manipulate, okay? So because the model ignores irrelevant information to the question, it then for it depends on the question being asked. The model you use to answer a question depends on the question. A more complicated question requires a more complicated model. So let's make this concrete. What do I mean? Say, this is you, and that's the piano, and your question is, how much time before the piano squishes me? Well, you can build a one-dimensional model of motion of a massive object under gravity, right? It's really a one-dimensional question. Sure, we live in a three, four-dimensional world, or 11 dimensions if you believe in string theory, but really there's only one critical dimension to this problem, which is your distance from the piano. Right? Um, it doesn't matter the shape of the piano, etc. So you build a model, and you ignore the color of the piano, the make of the piano, the rotation of the piano, the fact that it's actually a piano, right? the piano -ness. None of that is going to matter when it comes down crushing on top of you. Even if there's like a small breeze from the side, right? It's, sure, it's slightly relevant, but it's not going to change your answer, so you can disregard it. Uh, the, how much you spent on your shoes, all of these things are totally irrelevant to getting the answer. So you discard them from your model, and you build a model that you can deal with, right? Because a simple one-dimensional motion of a heavy object under gravity is something you're, you, should, you should know how to do, and it's a question we can answer, right? So this complex question of swarming piano molecules and air molecules and everything becomes a simple question. And we keep the critical information so the prediction of our model is relevant to reality, right? And all we need to know is how fast is it moving, how high is it above me, and what are the equations of motion of a heavy object under the force of gravity? If I know that, then I can predict how much time I have. So this is what I mean by physics predicting the future. Okay, now, physics is not the only place we build models. In fact, before you even heard the word physics, and before you took any science, you had models in your head about the way the world works, right? You had intuitive models, because you've been in the world for a long time, and you learned what happened, and you kicked the ball, or you fell downstairs or dropped something on somebody's head. You built your own intuitive models, right? These models can be useful, but sometimes they're critically wrong. All right? And if, for example, if you ask the five-year-old, if you kick an object on a frictionless surface, how long will it keep going? They'll think that it rolls for a while and then stops, right? Because that's their experience. Um, so intuitive models are, are sometimes wrong, which is why we rely on physics models. Okay, so let's say, for example, we're dealing with a piano, but now this piano is on the top of a pirate ship, okay? Somebody's hijacked this piano and they're holding it on the very, very top of the pirate ship, and the pirate ship is moving along, okay? And they, and they drop the piano, okay? So pirate ship is in motion, somebody, the, the piano's on the ship, and then it's dropped. So the question is, will the piano keep moving with the ship, its trajectory looks like this, including some forward motion, Right, so that it stays at the same position relative to the pirate ship, or will the pirate ship leave the piano behind? Right, once, you, once they've let go of the piano, the piano just falls straight down from the place it was dropped, and the, and the pirate ship moves forward without it. So does the, does the piano move in this way, or does it move that way? Right? Now, most people's intuitive models tell them that the pirate ship leaves the piano behind. In fact, this was common knowledge, this was commonly thought for thousands of years. In fact, this was an argument against the Earth moving around the sun. Because people thought, well, if the Earth is moving around the sun, then any time you drop something, it would get left behind relative to the motion of the Earth. 
right? So obviously the Earth can't be moving. <clears throat> so this is an intuitive model most people have, right? And this intuitive model is wrong. Now, say for example you're standing on the dock and they're about to drop this piano, right? And this is critical that you have the right model because if the piano is, you have to ask, is the piano going to hit me or should I move out of the way? Now, uh, Arist Aristotelian physics, which dominated until Newton, he said that pianos tend to, just tend to travel down, and regardless of how fast the ship is moving, the piano will travel down. But people for a long time believed that regardless of how fast the piano was moving when it was dropped, it would just move straight down, that the ship would leave it behind. So if you listen to Aristotle and you said, oh, I'm going to step out of the way, because I think it's going to land here, you could actually step right into the path of this piano if you listen to the intuitive model, okay? <clears throat> so we use mathematical models, not intuitive models. That doesn't mean you can't use your intuition. In fact, you should use your intuition to check the answer. Because if you get an answer that's crazy, it's like, does that make sense? How could it possibly make sense, right? If the piano is 10 feet above you and you calculate that you have a million years before it lands, you shouldn't just trust the math, right? You should use your intuition to check the answer that it's physical, that it's realistic, and go back and find your mistake, okay? The amazing thing about the Aristotelian models is that they were very easy to check. Somebody could have just taken a ship, you don't need a piano, but like a rock, and done this test, dropped it from the top of a ship, and disproven Aristotelian physics, just by doing that simple example, right? Simple experiment. <clears throat> the fascinating thing about the Greek physics is that they saw no need to do experiments to verify their theories. They thought they could understand the universe purely by thinking about what's going on in their heads. They had no need to go out and actually check these things. And so this culture of experimental verification, what we can now call empiricism, was only developed thousands of years later. Uh, so that's why nobody checked this, because nobody thought about checking things. In general. Really sort of fascinating change in the way we view the world. All right. So <clears throat> that's my concept of what physics is and why it's fun and why it's interesting. Um, what do I actually do? So I'm a physicist. I spend most of my days doing research. And the kind of research I do is uh, fundamental particle physics. So I work at the collider in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider, which is in the news about five years ago because people thought it was going to destroy the universe, and about and last year because we discovered a new particle called the Higgs boson. All right, and my questions, the questions I want answers, the reason I'm doing physics, is because I want to know what's the world made out of, and I want to know if matter can be infinitely subdivided. Right? Can you keep finding smaller and smaller parts, or is there a basic fundamental unit? If there is, what does that mean? Okay, so <clears throat> I'll tell you very briefly about my research, it's not really the topic of this class, but just so that it gives you a sense for what kind of things I like to think about. So I'm talking about understanding what the world is made out of, right? And not weird things, just like normal, everyday things, like our ex-governor, right? And amazingly, we know that if you take apart our ex-governor, and in fact, anything else a human has ever tasted, touched, seen, interacted with in any way, any of those things can be constructed out of atoms, right? So we've gone already from a nearly infinite variety of things in this universe, right? iPhones, Arnold Schwarzeneggers, plants, trees, stars, dirt, whatever. There's a nearly infinite variety. And that can be described by about 100 elements. From those 100 elements, you can construct anything. It's an enormous step forward. It's, it's, it's fantastic and incredible um, that we build, take it down to about 100 building blocks. All right, but we're not done there. Of course we know <clears throat> that the atom contains electrons and nucleus. The nucleus contains protons and neutrons. Inside the protons and neutrons are quarks, okay? Up quarks and down quarks. So from the up quark and down quark, you can make the proton and the, elect and the neutron. <clears throat> Here you have protons and neutrons, and those are up quarks and down quarks. You have taken up of those and you add some electrons to it, and you get atoms. So now, instead of describing a near-infinite universe in terms of uh, about 100 elements, now we can describe a near-infinite universe in terms of three fundamental building blocks. Right? From these three things, we can build anything. It's pretty incredible. But it turns out it's not true. Um, there are other fundamental objects in the universe that we discovered along the way. So I told you about the up quark and the down quark. Turns out there are four more quarks out there. 
And they're exactly the same as the up cork or down cork, except that they're heavier. And nobody knows why they exist, or what they're useful for, or what they mean. We just know that they're there. We've seen them, we've made them, we've played with them, these exotic forms of matter. In addition to the electron, there's also something called the neutrino. The neutrino is a tiny particle that has almost no mass and almost never interacts with anything. You could shoot a neutrino through a light year of lead. All right, a light year of lead. And it would have a 50% chance of interacting. Okay, so these things almost never interact. And they're produced copiously, they're everywhere. There's like, I forget the number, but it's like 10 to the 10 neutrinos per square centimeter per second going through the Earth. Okay, so a huge, vast, massive flux of neutrinos going through us all the time, but mostly we, they ignore us. So it's like a, another universe only barely coupled to our own. All right, so neutrinos are everywhere. And just like uh, the quarks, electrons and neutrinos have heavy versions of themselves. So there's a particle that's just like the electron, but fatter, the muon. And the tau, which is like the super fat cousin, right? <laughs> Can't even get out of the house. And this guy also has two cousins. And we don't know why every particle seems to have two copies, or if there's a third copy, how many copies there are, what it means. We don't know. What we do know is that there are some patterns in these building blocks, and we're trying desperately to figure out what those patterns are, because the, we think those patterns give us hints as to some even more fundamental, smaller description of matter. All right, Just like the way you look at the periodic table of the elements, and you say, um, these guys are pretty stable, these guys are pretty active, and these guys are metallic, and blah, blah, blah. And you notice patterns here in the structure. Those patterns, these emergent phenomena in the periodic table come from the patterns of electron orbitals, right? They're not random. They reveal something deeper about the structure of matter. In the same way, I'll get to your question in just a moment. In the same way, looking at the patterns in this fundamental table of the particles can give you a clue as to what's going on underneath, right? I think it's very unlikely that this is the final description of physics. For example, um, according to modern theories of physics, the electric charge of the electron, which is exactly opposite that of the proton, is a pure coincidence. Okay? Those are two independent fundamental parameters, the charge of the proton and the charge of the electron. It just happens to be that they're exactly opposite and equal so that we can get hydrogen and stable atoms and nucleus and life and chemistry, etc. According to the theory, that's a total coincidence. All right, so maybe it's a total coincidence, or maybe it's a clue that there's something deeper going on. They're both two sides of some fundamental coin. All right, question? Uh, didn't somebody come up with a theory that the Higgs boson interacts with the up quark, the down quark, the neutrino, and the electron to make them have heavier and lighter cousins? So the Higgs boson does interact with all these guys, and all these guys do get their masses from the Higgs boson. But it doesn't explain why we have all these particles, the pattern of the particles. Also, it doesn't even explain why they have different masses. For example, this, the up quark here is very, very light, much lighter than hydrogen. The top quark is so heavy that a single top quark is heavier than a gold nucleus. Okay, so there's a huge variation in these masses we don't understand. Now, the Higgs boson does interact with all of them. And it, give, it interacts with the top quark more and gives it more mass, and the up quark less and gives it less mass, but we don't know why. We don't know why the top quark interacts more with the Higgs boson than the up quark does. Other questions? OK. So the tools of the trade are particle accelerators. We, um, there was a particle accelerator outside Chicago, which uh, was the highest energy collisions in the world until recently. Now I work at this one outside uh, Geneva, Switzerland. 33 kilometer ring, which is pretty cool. Um, it's nestled between two sets of mountains. It's really beautiful. <clears throat> and what we'll discover at these accelerators depends on what's there to be discovered. We're probing a new frontier, right? This tiny the frontier of very high energy and very small distance scales. And we're recreating conditions that existed, you know, billions of years ago. This kind of things haven't, this kind of energy density hasn't been around since the Big Bang. So we're creating particles that haven't been around since the Big Bang. And hopefully probing things about what the universe was like when it was young and getting some insight into how it was made. Okay, and if you want to learn more about my research, uh, I have a couple of um, comics that were put together uh, in collaboration with a comic artist. And uh, you can look at, um, here's a link for example, you can get this on the slide. Describes it in a sort of easy to digest format.
Okay. Any other questions about, uh, about that? All right, so the last thing I want to say about particle physics, because our topic this quarter is not particle physics, but basic mechanics, is that um, I really encourage all of you, since you're physics majors, to think carefully about the kind of physics you're interested in and to pursue research opportunities. You might think, I'm a freshman, what can I do? Right? But I have, in my research group, six undergraduates, at least half of which came out of physics seven classes that I taught and students were interested in and showed some skill and some alacrity. Um, if you have an interest and you can teach yourself the skills necessary to be useful, which in the case of my research group basically, basically means just coding, then follow that interest. Go find the professor who works on that topic you find fascinating. See what they're doing, see if you can help out. Get yourself a summer research program, etc. Okay? Don't be shy. It's up to you to go out and pursue the things you're interested in. So if you find this stuff is exciting, great, come talk to me about it. Maybe we can find you a research opportunity. If you think making cool new kinds of goop is exciting, we have people who do that. If you want to understand how stars are formed, we have one of the best dark matter galactic uh, simulation groups in the whole country here. So there are really amazing research opportunities, and people are open to having freshmen involved. So don't be shy, OK? And if you want advice about that, I'm also the freshman physics advisor. So feel free to come talk to me about it with that hat on. OK? Okay. All right. Um, and you'll notice, by the way, that we're having our class videotaped. Um, this is because UCI likes to put things, is thinking about putting things online. It's not because we're part of some reality show. Um, so this can be videotaped and put online. I guess you can look at them if you have questions about it. Um, don't feel shy. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to do a, we have 40 minutes left. We're going to do a lightning review of physics two, okay, which covers the first three chapters in your book. The first one is just units, standards, conventions, how vectors work, basic stuff you might find pretty dull. I just want to make sure we're all talking the same language. I'll go through it pretty fast. Second, we'll talk about motion in one dimension, okay, so simple motion in one dimension, and then we'll talk about two-dimensional motion. And that's when, and after two-dimensional motion is when this class picks up the material for this course, okay. Okay, so chapter one is unit standards conversions. And I should say also, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I have had my class videotape before, which is a very useful experience as a professor to see what it's like to listen to yourself. And one of the most important things I learned was not to be afraid of pauses. You teach a concept, um, you should give a pause to allow people to sink it in and think of a question. So if you see me waiting for a few seconds after I teach you something, that's just because I'm just giving you an opportunity to ask a question, not because I have early onset Alzheimer's or anything. <laughs> okay, so the units we're using in this class, of course, are SI units, and the basic units are length, mass, time, temperature, etc. We use meters, kil kilograms, and seconds. Okay, and then from these basic units, you can derive units like area. Area is dimension squared, volume is dimension cubed. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Speed is demand is uh, distance over time, right? Length over time units. Acceleration is length over time squared. And dimensions are useful because they help you simplify your answer and and you can check things. So, for example, um, if you have an equation, the dimensions have to be equal on both sides. So, well, here's an equation. Velocity is acceleration times time. Right? Let's check the units of that. Velocity is length over time. Acceleration is length over time squared. Time is units of time. All right, so this time cancels out one of these, and you get that acceleration times time is length over time, just like velocity is length over time. All right, so that works. Distance can be written as one half acceleration times time squared. Here's an equation, right? Distance obviously is units of length. Acceleration is length over time squared. Time squared is time squared. This cancels this, and you get that 1 half at squared has units of length. So that seems about right. All right. An incorrect example is what if you say, well, if you write down velocity is acceleration times time squared, which it isn't. And physically, you can see this just can't be true, because velocity is units of length over time. It's a speed. And at squared is units of length. So you can't ever say, like, 5 meters per second equals 10 meters. It's nonsensical. Okay, so these units are important. 
<coughs> All right. So let's see if you're paying attention. Which of these expressions has the correct means? Should be enough time. Click, click, click in, everybody. Okay, so almost everybody says B. All right? And in fact, time is unit of time. Oops. Distance over velocity. See, the time cancels, so the uh, velocity, the distance cancels, and you just get units of time again. Questions? Okay. And of course, we need to convert between units. <clears throat> For example, you can look up what a mile is or an inch is. Um, and if you're going to convert, you need to have the units cancel. So here we have inches, and then we multiply by meters over inches, canceling the units and giving us meters. Basically, units are just a good way to avoid making silly mistakes. Okay? And there are a bunch of cool, crazy. Um, Prefixes you can use if you have a, a lot of units, a lot of whatever, you can do yada kilograms or yocto kilograms. I see. These can be looked up. These are all in your book. Um, the unit conversion is similar here. If you want to convert from kilo kilometers per second to meters per millisecond, then you need to include these conversion ratios and make sure everything cancels. So my arms aren't long enough, so I use the mouse. So here, for example, this kilometer cancels this kilometer because this is on top and this is on the bottom. Um, this seconds cancels this seconds and you're left with meters per millisecond. All right? Or if you want to convert 10 kilometers per second into megameters per kilosecond, then you can do those conversions too. You just need to know these ratios. Okay, basic stuff. Significant figures. All right, this uh, expresses how much certainty or uncertainty we have in a measurement. If, for example, you have some circle and you're measuring its radius as a physical measurement, and your measuring device, say your ruler, has an uncertainty of 0.1 centimeters, then you should write the answer as 6.0 plus or minus 0.1. The 0, 0.0 here is showing how much information you have about your measurement. If you had written 6, then that's not accurate because you have more information than just 6. It's 6.0 not 6.2 or 5.9. Um, if you've written 6.00, that's too much information. Right? It's more, this digit here, you have no information about what should be in this digit because your measuring device only goes up to this digit. Same with this uh, uh, Sylvie example, right? It's obviously showing more information than you have, so it's inaccurate. Uh, in everything we do, we're gonna try to use accurate significant figures because it's a good habit to have. Uh, in practice, you get the significant figures wrong, I'll mark off you know, one point out of a thousand or something. It's not, in my view, the most important uh, thing, the thing you should be focusing most on. Try to do it right. You'll notice I make mistakes with significant figures because it's a hassle. But we should all learn it and try to do it right. Okay? Uh, and then you have to carry it through the, the calculation sometimes. So for example, if you measure the radius for the quantity you're interested in, is the area, that has the dependence on the radius squared. And so, you have to carry that information in and not, not, tr not write too much information about your calculation. So here we only have two digits of information, right? Because we have 0 0.1. And so the answer needs to also have two digits of, of, of precision. This is more information than we have. Right? OK. Vectors, all right? So vector is a way to write two-dimensional information compactly. So you have an x-axis and a y-axis. You write a vector A, and a vector can be thought of as either coordinates or sum of, of, um, of vectors just along the, the axes. So this vector A is the sum of AX plus AY. Right? Uh, these are the component vectors. Right? Now, sometimes we write vectors here with an arrow over them, 
and then we write scalars are the, the length of the vector. Right? We write that without the vector uh, notation on top. All right, so you can take any, any vector you take, you can take it apart. So this is your a vector, this is your a y, your a x. Right? Uh, you can also calculate the length of these components using trig. We can say a x is a times cosine of theta. Right? This is theta here. So the length of AX is the length of this side times cosine of theta. Length of this side is, is AX is, is a magnitude of this side times the sine of theta, right? And then you can, you can take these guys and combine them again to get the total length of the vector. You can combine them in this way with the tangent to get theta back. All this stuff you should be pretty familiar with, all right? Um, when you add two vectors, there's a couple ways to think about it. Right, one way is to say, I'm going to take this vector A and break it into the components, the x component, the y component, do the same thing with the b vector, add the x components together, add the y components together, and that's my result. Right? So this is the x component of my r vector is just the sum of the x components of A and B, and the y component of my r vector is the sum of the y components of A and B. All right? And here you can see it visually. Some people like to learn things visually. Some people like to write them down. But if you're adding A and B to get R, right, you can add them visually by doing this tip-to-tail approach. You take the tip of one vector, put it on the tail of the other one, and then you draw the result from the beginning of one to the end of the combination. And you can see physically that the x component of the resulting vector is just the sum of the x component of A and x component of B, and the same thing for Y. Okay, so let's do an example with vectors. Well, say the minute hand of a clock is 10 centimeters long, okay? What's the magnitude of the displacement of the tip of the hand as it goes from 8 to 8.15? Well, let's, we can write this in terms of vectors. So vector A is 0, 10. Vector B is 10, 0. We're interested in the length of the vector, um, the length of displacement from here to here. Not the length of the path traveled, which would be along a circle, but the distance from where it started to where it ended, right? So that's the vector b minus a, right, which, is, which has these components, 10 minus 10, because it just did b minus a. And then I take the magnitude of that, right, which are these lines, which is the square root of this, so it's just it's 10 root 2, right? It's the distance between where it started and where it finished. Okay, so that was chapter 1. Right, pretty merciful, pretty basic stuff. Okay, <clears throat> now let's ramp it up and actually talk about um, objects in motion. Now, to think about this, we need to uh, understand what we mean by some of the quantities we're going to define, and we need to make sure we understand what we mean by functions. Right. So remember that a function, x of t in math, means that it has a value, and exactly one value at every point in time. A function cannot have two values at, at a point in time. This is very useful because many physical quantities have this property also, right? Unless you're a quantum mechanical object, you have one location at any given time, right? And for any, every time, you have a location. This is very convenient to describe in terms of a function, right? You just draw a line that describes the relationship between your, in this case, position and the time, okay? And at any given time, you can plug in, for example, t1 is some point on the time axis, and the value of the function is x at t1. Okay, now you can also think about the change, right? You have t1, you have t2. So there's x at t1, x at t2. The change in x over this time period from t1 to t2 is just the difference in the x values. Delta x t1 minus x t, sorry, x t2 minus x t1. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the difference. The slope of this function, right? is the different is the rise over the run, the difference in the x values divided by the difference in the, in the time values. So delta x over delta t. And that's the slope. Now this is the average slope between times t1 and t2. Okay? If we want the instantaneous slope, then we bring t1 and t2 together. As this difference goes to zero, then we get the slope at that particular moment. Okay, so this is the 
the calculus limit. All right, so we start here. As we bring this together, we define the slope at a particular moment, which we write dx dt. It's the derivative of the function. Okay. <clears throat> now, in this case, for this simple example, you see that x is linear, right, which means it has a constant slope. So if you graph the slope, the slope is also a function. dx dt is also a function. Also has a physical meaning, right? dx dt is the velocity. It's the change in distance with respect to time. In this case, the velocity is constant. All right, so let's make sure we're talking the same language. Which of these two functions has the largest average slope between 0 and t? in, 30 seconds should be enough. Okay, most of you said A. Why A? Well, the average slope is determined by the change in x over the change in time, right? The time period was determined, specified as 0 to t. So they have the, they have the same delta t, so the one with the larger delta x is going to have a larger average slope, right? So obviously this one here has a larger delta x, this one has almost zero delta x. Okay. Which of these has the largest instantaneous slope anywhere in zero comma t? Upside down. <laughs> this is why I don't grade you on your response. Um, okay, so obviously this one has a fixed slope, right? It's the same slope everywhere, so the instantaneous slope is equal to the average slope. Here the slope goes very positive, it goes negative, it's almost zero. But at this point here, the instantaneous slope is larger than it is over here. Questions? Okay, good. So our three friends this quarter are going to be position, velocity, and acceleration. And we're going to learn to think about these things and translate back and forth from one to the other. Okay, position obviously is, is position at any time. Velocity is the slope of position. Acceleration is the slope of velocity. Right? And you can keep going. You can say, what's the slope of the acceleration? It's called the jerk. You can say, what's the slope of the jerk? You can keep going forever. Right? Most of these functions are infinitely differentiable. But we're only going to deal with problems that either have constant acceleration or no acceleration. So that's the extent you'll have to deal with. Okay? So here's an example. Let's think about these three things at the same time. If, for example, we have a graph, we know the position. Right? We know x of t. So at any point in time, we know the position. This is an incredible amount of information. Right? I mean, you think it's trivial. Yeah, sure, I know the position function. This means you know exactly where it is, no matter what time it is. It's an infinitely dense piece of information. Also, it predicts things forward in the future, right? If you really had the position function for something, uh, you could tell me where it's going to be in 5 billion years. Right? Just plug in t plus 5 billion. So it's an incredible piece of information. And we shouldn't forget that it also contains information about the velocity and the acceleration. All I need to do is differentiate, differentiate this guy right, and to get the velocity. So if you have an analytical form for x of t, that is, you have an expression, and then you can use your calculus knowledge to get an expression for the derivative also. Right? But you can also just do it by eye. You can say, well, here the slope is positive right, and fairly large. I'm going to put a mark up there. And then it, the slope gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? And then it's, and it's approaching zero. Right? Pretty easy. You can play the same game with the acceleration. You say, well, the acceleration is the slope of the velocity. It looks to me like the slope is negative and constant. So I draw a straight line below the zero. Questions? And you can go the other direction as well, right? If I gave you the acceleration, you could, see, you could figure out what the velocity is. Now, to go from position to velocity uses the derivative. To go from velocity to acceleration uses the derivative. How do you go from acceleration to velocity? The integral, right? Or I'll sometimes I'll call it the antiderivative. All right? All right, good. 
So let's do an example problem. We have a super ball. It's 45 grams. It's traveling at 27 meters per second, bounces off a brick wall, and comes back at 19 meters per second. Okay? A high-speed camera recorded it and determined that the ball is in contact for the wall for three milliseconds. What's the magnitude of the average acceleration of the ball during this time interval? So first of all, what does it mean that the ball is in contact with the wall for three milliseconds? Let's think about the physical model we're using here. It stopped. The ball stopped? Okay. Well, that's the time period in which the acceleration, I mean, in which the velocity is changing. That's right. So the velocity is 27 meters per second in one direction. Something happens for three milliseconds and then the velocity is going the other direction. What happens in those three milliseconds? Yes, it's accelerated. The ball squishes. The ball squishes, why? The ball squishes itself? It's scared of the wall? or What's acting on the ball? The force is on one side. It's not equally distributed all the way through. Right. Sorry, in the back corner? No, uh, normal force of the wall. Normal force of the wall, yes. And behind you? Uh, it's experiencing impact as a momentum shooting. That's right. Okay. Good. So the ball, we have a model of a ball, which is not rigid, right? If our model of the ball was a rigid object, this wouldn't make any sense. Because the ball couldn't be in contact with the wall for more than an instant. Instead, the ball squishes as it hits the wall, right? And during that time, it's in contact with the wall and then it rebounds. So the, a model of the ball is more like a spring. Right? Not really like a ball, more like a spring. Okay, so how do we calculate? The question is asking, now we've understood what the problem is. We have a physical model in our mind for how to deal with this. What are they asking us again? Oh yeah, what's the magnitude of the average acceleration? How do we figure that out? In the back. You have the That's right. So we have the initial velocity. We have the final velocity. We're interested in the acceleration. Right? Well, what is the average acceleration? Remember it said average acceleration. Well, the average acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, right? Delta V over delta T. Do we know delta V? Sure. It's V final minus V initial. And you have to be careful with the signs here, right? Because in the way it's in the in the problem, it says it's 27 meters per second towards the brick wall, and then it's going in the other direction. So we need to keep track of our sign convention, right? One way is positive, the other way is negative. So I've chosen this 19 to be positive, and then 27 to be negative. So the difference between them, <coughs> divided by the time it takes, is 3 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds, it gives us the answer, which is 15.3 times 10 to the 4 meters per second squared. Questions about that? Good. Okay. So let's do another example. Say we have this model, right? Here's position as a function of time. Okay. What does this look like to you? Sorry? Kind of looks like a bird. All right. Could be a bird, yeah. But if I said to you, here's the position function of an object, it looks like a bouncing ball, right? What looks like a bouncing ball about it? Right. So what's happening here? This is gravitational, like this is a free falling object under gravity, right? Accelerating towards the ground. What happens here? Impact against the ground, right? Positive, instant moment of positive acceleration. And then again, free falling motion under gravity, this time with a positive velocity. All right, so instead of accelerating, it's slowing down. All right, so let's reconstruct that piece by piece. What does the velocity look like? Well, the velocity is the slope of this guy. It starts off basically zero, and gets more and more negative, right? And then all of a sudden, very quickly, in a very short amount of time, the last problem is three times 10 to the negative three seconds, the velocity goes from negative to positive. And then what? And then it drifts slowly down again, right? And you can either understand that physically, like gravity's pulling you down, gravity's pulling you down, wall kicks you up, and then gravity's pulling you down again. Or you can think about it mathematically, what is the slope of this line? 
zero, more, 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 more negative, more, more negative, suddenly positive. Like look from here, very negative to very positive in a moment. And then less and less and less positive to zero. And then you can look at the acceleration. <clears throat> the acceleration is constant and negative while it's under gravitational free fall, except for the moment that it hits the wall. Now, how do you draw this? Technically, I mean, it, it depends exactly on the details of your model. Is it a real moment of, of acceleration? Is it constant acceleration by the ball? None of that really matters. <clears throat> we just know it's some large positive acceleration. Okay? So you can follow the math, but you can also use your physical instincts to understand what might be happening. Okay, and these are the equations for motion in the three conditions that we're going to consider. Right? So let's consider the, the, the simplest one first. You have a position, you have no velocity and no acceleration. So until the end of time, you're going to be in that position. Right? This is your equation of motion forever. Okay. Simplest case. Now let's consider the case when you have velocity but no acceleration. All right, well you started here because at time equals zero, this just reverts, reverts to the initial position. How do, we, how do we change your position with respect to if you have velocity? Well, it's just velocity times time. Right? So your position changes is according to x0 plus v0t. If you add in acceleration, then you have one more term. It's 1 half at squared. And you might ask, well, why is it t squared? Right? Velocity times time, but it's acceleration times time squared. Why is it t squared? Why this, this structure for that formula? Okay, it's the only way they, for the units to work, right? That's true. Why, but what about the one half? So this equation can be derived from the equation below it, which is the velocity. Velocity is the initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Because remember, acceleration is what? It's change in velocity with respect to time. So velocity is just initial velocity plus the change in velocity with respect to time times the time. Remember, we're assuming constant acceleration in this case. So to get the position, you just integrate the velocity, and that's where the 1 half comes from. Another way to think about these t's is the time dependence. If you're accelerating, then you're going to be changing the position more and more rapidly as time goes on, right? So acceleration has a bigger impact on your position, especially at larger times, because it accumulates the velocity. That's why velocity and acceleration have different time dependencies on your position. So these are the equations you really need to know for one-dimensional motion, right? <clears throat> so let's go back to this case, right? A freely falling piano. Here we have an object moving under the force of gravity. The initial velocity could be positive, meaning that somebody could have thrown it up. It could be zero, meaning they just let it go. Or negative, they could be throwing it down at you. Right? So <clears throat> in the case of gravity, this is the case when the acceleration is negative and constant. In this case, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay. So this falls under one of the equations I showed you a couple of slides ago. Right? And here are the three, three cases. Either you just drop the object, meaning you have initial position is positive and no initial velocity, or you throw the object, meaning you're starting it from above ground and the velocity is either positive or negative, depending on how you throw it. Or you could call it a tossed object, which means you start on the ground and you throw the velocity up, right? you're throwing the ball up. In every case, this is the equation of motion. Right? It's just the equation I showed you before with y's written instead of x's. Right? If you know the initial position, the initial velocity, and the acceleration, you can predict the position at any time. Okay? So here's an example. A student throws a set of keys ver vertically upwards to her sorority sister, who's in a window four meters above her. Okay? So she's four meters above. The keys are caught a second and a half later by the sorority sister's outstretched hand. So the question is, with what initial velocity were the keys thrown? Okay, so first let's just build our physical model quickly in our head. We're throwing a set of keys. Does the fact that it's keys matter at all? 
We're not considering like the internal rotation of the keys or the jangling of the keys or the sunlight glinting off the keys or like the fuzzy couche troll head she has on the keys or anything. So we could just consider it like a point object, right? Might as well just be a ball, okay? And is this, mo is this a one-dimensional problem or a two-dimensional problem? One, right? So she throws it up and then it comes down. There's no information about horizontal velocity and none of that would even matter. So we have a one-dimensional motion problem. And what about the acceleration? We have acceleration from gravity and we have initial velocity, right? You might say there's acceleration when the short sister is throwing it, but we could start our model the moment the ball or the keys would ever leave her hand. And we only have to consider constant negative acceleration from gravity and the initial velocity. You could start at a moment earlier and say, starts with zero velocity, gets an impulse from the sorority sister, and then we're going to model it forward. It's a little bit more complicated. We could still do it. This is assuming when the keys are caught, the keys have reached the pinnacle of the... Why does it assume that? Um, because otherwise the initial velocity could have been... Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out in the second part of the problem. All right, so the question is, with what initial velocity were the keys thrown? Okay, well, let's write down our equation in motion. We'll say the key started at height zero, so we'll define our zero to be where the initial was thrown from. We have the initial, we do not have the initial velocity, right? That's a, that's a variable. Um, and we, we do know the acceleration, right? So we can simplify this to be vt minus gt squared over two. So the position is a function of the, we know the velocity, the acceleration, and we don't know the velocity. However, we are given a time point. We say we know the position at one point in time. We know that after a second and a half, the keys are four, second, four meters up in the air. Right? We don't know whether they've gone up and then come back down. We don't know whether they're on the up. We don't know if this is the maximum height it achieves. We just know that one and a half seconds later, it's four meters up. This is enough information to let us solve this problem because it's, we have only one unknown. So we plug in the time and velocity. We know g already, and we can solve for the initial velocity. Right? 10 meters per second. Any questions about how we did that? OK. Second question is, what's the velocity of the keys just before they were caught? OK, so well, for that, we just need the velocity equation. That's the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. Initial velocity we just figured out. 10. We know the acceleration. We know the time. The answer is a negative. So what does that mean? It's coming back down, right? She missed them on the way up. She caught them on the way back down. It also means there is a... It must mean that there's another time uh, at which y is equal to 4 meters, right? An earlier time. In fact, if she's 4 meters above, and they're thrown at 10 meters per second initially, then they're definitely going to get four meters up in less than a second. All right, questions about that? OK, so that was chapter two, one dimensional motion. Okay? If that felt like a familiar review to you, then good, we're on track. Two dimensional motion seems a lot more complicated. You got things moving in two, in two directions, right? The, the proper problems can be written in a much more confusing manner. However, somebody a long time ago made this brilliant intuitive leap to separate motion into two orthogonal directions, x and y. Right? And velocity and acceleration are completely independent in the two, so the two can be broken down into two problems. So two-dimensional motion is just two one-dimensional motions. Right? Any two-dimensional problem can be described by two um, functions. So instead of having just x, um, you have x and y. And sometimes there's a relationship between x and y. So here's, for example, uh, what x looks like. Here's what y looks like. And you can draw y of t at the same time as x of t. OK, and so we have this. Now we have to think about things in terms of vectors rather than just thinking about them in terms of position. So instead of having our position be x, which is just a number, or a function, which gives a number, it's r which is a vector, which is a, a short way to write two numbers together. Okay. So in this case, for example, you have an initial position and a final position. Here's the path to some pirate ship. This is delta r. Right? It's the change in position. 
Anytime you are confused by a problem that's in two dimensions or using vector notation, just break down this delta r into delta x and delta y. It's really just a shorthand. Anytime you're writing a vector, you can always just write down the components. So don't be confused and try to think about things in two dimensions. If it's tricky, break it down into the one dimensional components if that makes it easier for you to think about. Okay, so for example, the translation between one dimensional quantities and two dimensional quantities, you go from position to vector position. What is the vector position? It's just a, a shorthand way of writing two positions at the same time. Right? We don't want to be writing x comma y all the time. We're lazy, so we just write r. It's just notation. Right? In, this class, in physics, it's important to distinguish between mathematical exercises, like you set up the problem and now you just turn the crank, and notation, right, which is just like a shorter way to write things, and the actual physics. The actual physics goes from reading the problem, building a physical model, and setting up your equations. Then you're done with the physics. And you just have to do the math to crank out to get the actual answer. The physics is in building that model in your head and using it to answer the question. Okay, so velocity is, was delta x over delta t, now it's delta r over delta t. What does that mean? A ratio of vectors. That seems confusing, right? It's really a vector of ratios. See? Delta, uh, velocity is delta r over delta t. It's really just delta x over delta t, comma delta y over delta t. So if you have a hard time imagining how you take the ratio of two vectors, just remember, it's two one-dimensional problems written together. Same thing with derivatives, right? Velocity is dx dt. Now, vector velocity is dr dt. What is the derivative of a vector? What does that mean? Well, it's just the derivative of each of the components. Same story for average and instantaneous acceleration, okay? So remember, when you're doing a two-dimensional problem, there are two components which you can treat separately, x and y. All right? And the amazing thing is the physics is separate for, for the x and y direction. Like, for example, say you have this motion of a hockey puck. Okay? It has some initial velocity in x, but nothing in y. So this arrow is supposed to represent the, the, the velocity. So the puck moves along in time. These are snapshots in time, right? It moves along, and the velocity is constant, so it's just moving along at a constant speed. All right? Say, for example, instead of having only x velocity, it also has y velocity. It's demonstrated by this arrow here. Then it also moves in, in y. But you notice its motion in x is unchanged. Right? Having velocity in y does not change anything about your velocity in x. y acceleration and y velocity have no bearing on position in x. That's the key to solving two-dimensional problems or nine-dimensional problems. Right? So let's do an example. A kicker attempts a field goal. He's 36 meters away. He kicks the ball at 20 meters per second at a 53 degree angle. By how much does it clear the bar if the bar is 3.05 meters? So how do we, what's our physical model for this problem? It's just like the one with the sorority sister, right? We don't care that it's a, a ball. We don't even really care that it's been kicked. We just care that it has, it's an object, it's a fixed object with initial velocity. But we know the initial velocity, right, 20 meters per second, at a 53 degree angle. That means we know the initial x velocity, which is uh, 20 meters per second times cosine of the angle, and the initial y velocity, which is 20 meters per second times sine of the angle, right? So now our object has initial x velocity and initial y velocity. We know the acceleration in x, zero, right? We know the acceleration in y, just gravity. And then we're asked a question about where it's going to be at a certain time. So let's write down the equations of motions that we have, right? So in x, there's some time at which it clears the ball, right? Let's use x to figure out how long it takes to get to the ball. Why should we use x? Because x is easy. x is constant velocity, no acceleration. It's given initial velocity in x, it never changes. So if we want to figure out how long it takes to get across the field, we can use the fact that it's traveling at constant velocity to figure out how long it takes to get there. So um, at what time is x 36 meters? Well, x is the initial velocity times cosine of the angle times time, right? We know the initial velocity. We know the angle. So we can solve this for time. It's three seconds. Does anybody have a question about how I figure out the time? So in these 2D problems, time is the link between the two dimensions, right? 
And usually you can use one dimension to solve the time and then apply that to the other dimension. So now we know how long it takes to get to the crossbar. All we need to do is figure out how high it was when it hit the crossbar, right? When, when it was at the same x position as the crossbar. How do we figure out how high it was? Well, we know the equation of motion. We know it started out at zero height. We know its initial velocity. It's just the initial velocity times the time sign. And we know the acceleration, right? Minus gt squared over two. So we just plug in. We know everything in this equation, and we can calculate exactly the height, 3.95 meters, which is almost a meter above the crossbar. So this was a two-dimensional problem. We broke it into two one-dimensional problems. We did the easy one first, x, we got the time, plugged that into the y version of the problem. OK. All right, so there's some more examples here. Um, we're running out of time, so let me just ask you this. Um, I'm happy to lecture from these slides. I'm also happy to work out all these problems and write the equations on the board uh, using this whiteboard, which is pretty nice, and they slide up and down. Um, so if you prefer watching me write them out and you think it's too lazy if I just show the slides, vote for that. If you really like the slides because you think you might probably have terrible handwriting and you'd be right, vote for the slides. Um, either way, make your preference known. Okay. Some of each, writing on the board. Okay, so I will probably do mostly writing on the board. Um, oops. But I'll do some slides also. And even when I write on the board, the slides will still be posted. I'm just going to use the slides as the basis of the lecture. Okay, question about that? Uh, what are your policies on eating using electronics and cell phones? What are my policies on eating? Yeah. Eat with your mouth. Uh, what's my policy? Uh, on eating your mouth. Oh, uh, officially no food is allowed in here. Um, cell phones, etc. I mean, do what you need to do. You're here to learn. Do what you have to do, okay? Uh, just try not to be rude. Uh, and answer one more question for me before you go. Thank you very much. See you guys on Tuesday.